Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. This is video number 41. And this video is going to be a little bit different than most of the rest of the videos in the series because we're going to take a step back, take a look at where we are and where we're going to wind up going. And we're also going to talk about some changes to the channel that are incoming that are going to make things a little bit more sustainable going forward. Okay, so before we jump into any of that, I want to really quickly thank the partners of the channel, which is the highest tier of membership, as well as the highest tier on Patreon. So our partners are Aarslia, Wenchang, Caden, Joel, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Anaudi. Thank you guys so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. Uh, I also want to give a big thanks to all the other folks here that are listed on the screen at the moment. The support from you guys means a lot to me and helps me grow this channel and be able to make investments into the channel. Speaking of investments, uh, some of the things that you may or may not be able to pick up on is I'm now using a better camera setup. Uh, I've also got a little bit of a better lighting setup here so that uh, you know, hopefully you guys can see me a little bit better um, for these sections of video where I'm on the screen. I've also gone ahead and changed out my microphone to something that is a far better setup. So uh, hopefully um, the quality of these videos is going to be bumped up a little bit just because I've sort of made some changes to sort of amp the quality up in that regard. Now, all of that being said, I want to talk about little bit about uh, sort of the direction of the channel and where I see the channel going from here, right? So until now, we've been largely tutorial based and that's been great. I know a lot of you have liked that tutorial based approach. It's done really well for us, but I think there are some shortcomings with that as well. So one of the things that happens, especially in this series, as far as um, you know, making a game engine goes, is it tends to mean that we have very long, long-winded videos. And there's not really too much of a way to get around that if we're showing all the code on the screen, right? Uh, we've had a couple recently run well over an hour, some of them bumping up almost against a two-hour barrier, right? And so that makes it kind of difficult for you guys to consume. It also makes it difficult to go back and be able to reference parts of the video because the videos are very long, but it also makes it kind of difficult for me to edit in the long run because one of those hour and a half long videos typically takes me two to three hours to actually record with multiple takes and all that. And then um, the actual editing of that means I have to go through all of that footage and edit it down. So it takes even longer than it did to actually record it. The problem with this is, like a lot of other people out there on YouTube, this is sort of a secondary thing for me, right? It's not my full-time job. Uh, I do work uh, full-time hours, 40 hours plus a week. And so it's becoming not very sustainable, right? It's very difficult for me to build up a backlog of videos that I can sort of keep uploading onto the channel in a schedule, right? And uh, I've had decent luck with it so far. I've only missed, I think, one or two weeks uh, since we actually started this series. And we're now 40 videos in. So I think that that's actually pretty good, but it's also been a lot of work to get there. And so I want to make um, a couple of adjustments around this, right? But before I get into those adjustments, I want to talk about a couple of other things that uh, this sort of format that we're currently using is limiting me on. So one of the things is it's very limiting on bug fixes, right? Because we go into such detail in the code that if there is a bug that I happen to not see, and it happens all the time because I might get talking and forget to put something in or paste something wrong or type something wrong, um, then it's very difficult for me to sort of patch that in a video series going backwards, right? Um, and in some cases, I've made a couple of extra, you know, 0.1 videos or whatever to make those corrections, but that isn't always necessarily going to be the best way to handle it. There are going to be circumstances where I think that's warranted, but I think one of the issues is it's just not very, again, sustainable. Uh, let's see. So there's also the fact that we are 40 videos into this series. Y'all don't need to watch me code every single line, right? Um, 
if you're 40 videos into this series and you don't understand how pointers work, for example, um, I'm not sure what to do for you. Uh, so I guess, well, I should say, you know, go and check out my C series because I am going to be actually posting a video discussing pointers in depth there. But I highly doubt you would have gotten this far in series without having an understanding of that, right? And that pointers is just one example, right? But you guys basically don't need to see me write every single thing on the screen, right? That's not really valuable past a certain point. I think at this point, uh, we've established patterns, we've established um, the way that I write code, and we've established basic debugging at this point. And I think it's safe to assume that any of you that have followed up to this point probably are watching the video at say one and a half or two times speed or skipping through parts of it or what have you. Um, because you really don't need to see me put every single section of code in there, right? That I think has run its course. So that is um, sort of another point. And my last and final point is I would much rather at this point explain concepts versus going through huge blocks of code, right? I'll go through code where it's relevant Anytime there is something that I need to technically point out, uh, sure, we can do a deep dive on the code. At this point, I think there is much more value in discussing how things work and maybe showing some visuals on the screen and, um, and going about it that way than necessarily always doing a deep dive into code. I know that's been valuable up to this point, but um, I think the value on that has, is diminishing quite a bit and already has diminished quite a bit. So. I want to talk a little bit about the direction we're going to go, and I'm sure you guys have kind of already figured this out a little bit, but I want to switch to a more presentation style of video going forward, right? It's going to switch away from tutorial and more into a presentation. And I mentioned before that we are going to be switching the format when we get to a point in the series that I think it is warranted, and I think now is that time. So what do I mean by a presentation format? Well. For one thing, I'm not going to go line by line um, or even block by block explaining the code on the screen anymore. Uh, basically, what I'm going to wind up doing is I'm going to go ahead and review a diff or at least the relevant parts of a diff. And what this will allow me to do is keep the code that is released consistent with the code that I'm actually recording in the video, which is not always as simple as you might think. And um, what that is also going to do is uh, it's going to allow me to focus on the way that things work versus the actual details of the code, which at this point isn't really as important because it's available open source for you guys. So to recap, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to switch to high level explanations with visual uh, charts and stuff to back that up. We are going to basically walk through code diffs at a very high level, and we're probably going to be skipping around quite a bit and only touching on the relevant portions of code. And then anything that is actually relevant enough to actually go into and do a deep dive on the code, we will absolutely do that. And there will be plenty of portions where we're going to be doing that. Uh, but the deep dive in the code is not going to be the focus of this series going forward, right? The code is going to be available freely for anybody to look at. Um, split up by commits by video, just like I've always done. So that will be there for you guys to reference. We don't need to do it all in video, okay? So what this is going to result in is videos that are a little bit shorter and easier to digest. And it's also going to make it a lot easier for you guys to understand how the various parts of this engine come together and work with one another, okay? One other thing that I wanna do on this channel is I want to get back to doing sort of dev logs as it were. And what I mean by this is I want to perhaps monthly or every other month, something like that, give a recap on what has happened with the engine at a very high level with some quick visual examples, just to give those of you who don't have the time to consume all the content, sort of a project update on the status of the project as a whole. And uh, what that's going to do is provide just a quick few minute video that uh, anybody can kind of come in and take a look and see where the project is at. And the other thing that's going to do is give us a sort of uh, 
list of videos that we can hit and look at our milestones and our checkpoints as we go along and be able to see the progress much more rapidly than if we were to go through all of the content that is available on this series, right? So the devlog series will be another series that's updated semi-regularly, but not on a set schedule at, like this series is, okay? So the way that I plan on tackling these devlogs is I am gonna start at the very beginning, meaning I'm gonna to have to go through all of our past content. And I'm going to uh, split that up by probably every other month or so. I'll look for clean um, points to, to cut the devlogs in. And I'll go ahead and post those um, as I manage to get them finished, right? So the first several devlogs that are gonna come out are all gonna be on content we've already covered, but uh, the devlogs after that will be somewhere around a month to two months uh, in coverage as to what has happened in the project, okay? All right, so that is it as far as the channel direction goes. So um, I should say channel direction and direction of this series and really the direction of uh, the Kohi engine in general, okay? So now what I wanna do is I want to switch gears a little bit and I actually want to take a look at uh, the actual project itself on Git. So let me go ahead and switch over. Okay. All right. So I want to quickly touch on uh, some PRs that have come through with Mac and Linux changes, as well as some bug fixes that have come through, because there are some important things that have happened in the last several days that uh, kind of need to be touched on um, that have come up. So um, the first thing is there has been uh, native Mac OS support added. Now I should mention that I have not actually verified that this is working um, as far as that goes. So I'm labeling this unofficial at this point uh, because I do not yet have a Mac to actually test this on. That is going to be changing, but uh, I do not have a Mac yet to test this on. So I can't verify any of that code um, until I actually obtain that. So uh, that is one thing I'm looking to do this year is to acquire a Mac. But um, for right now, it has been uh, community driven. So uh, Jad Tala here has made some uh, awesome contributions for this. And it took me a while to actually get them in. So I apologize about that. But thank you, Jad, for all the hard work that you've done to actually get this working on Mac OS. He says he's tried it on a couple of different machines and it's worked just fine for him. So thank you for that. Uh, and I've also um, merged in a pull request uh, from Adam Sultan um, regarding some uninitialized memory that was being used um, in the Linux platform layer. Um, it didn't wind up actually really affecting anything. It was just on the first iteration, but um, thank you very much for that. So I do want to reiterate that if you guys see something with the engine uh, that you think should be changed, uh, feel free to put in a, a pull request for it, right? Um, this is a community project, even though I am the one doing most of the coding. If you guys actually have a fix for something, feel free to put in a pull request. And as long as it meets the criteria I'm looking for um, and, you know, runs properly and whatnot, of course, uh, I am more than likely going to go ahead and accept it. So um, feel free to do that. And thank you to those of you who already have. So a couple of other things that I had to fix is uh, I actually started running this on another Linux setup that I have, uh, which is another laptop you guys can't see that's sitting here. That's got an older graphics card on it. It's got an 860M on it. And uh, that actually has uh, some fairly tight requirements in terms of how the uniform buffers work, um, which is actually a really good thing because it gives me a, a really, really good um, system to test against. So I actually had to submit a couple of fixes uh, to actually get it to work on that machine. And I'm sure that these are problems that some of you have run into before. And some of it is actually stuff that we have discussed before. So uh, we have here fixed various Linux build issues. And this one I'm actually gonna click into and go into um, directly. So um, 
for one thing, the uh, the make file was not actually making the bin folder, which is an issue on a brand new setup. And then uh, also the clean process was not uh, doing what it should have been um, in the engine, right? So it wasn't including the extension. So that's actually a pretty important thing to be able to actually rebuild that properly, as well as uh, it was actually not um, pathed correctly. So it actually wasn't doing anything, okay? And then uh, there was uh, another uh, issue on the um, the test bed using backslashes instead of forward slashes. And then um, one thing that happened uh, somehow is the clean all wound up getting uh, either removed or I never updated it. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, clean all SH did not exist. Um, which meant that if you went to go clean on the Linux environment, that you could not do so. So I've gone ahead and added this back in. Uh, the other thing is I added a couple of uh, things here for debugging because as I was debugging this issue, I wasn't really sure where the issue was um, right away. So I added a couple of small things. Uh, one of the first things that I did was uh, this check in Vulkan backend. Uh, I went ahead and uh, change the error to a fatal if for some reason the wait for fences fails, right? If that fails, that's a fatal error. Um, so I just changed the reporting on that. Probably the biggest issue that I had was here in the Vulkan types uh, INL. So the uh, material shader instance UBO as well as the UI shader instance UBO had to be padded out to 256 bytes because of a requirement on some cards that requires the UBOs to actually be 256 bytes apart, okay? And so uh, I figured that out. That was also an issue on this machine that was not an issue on my desktop uh, GPU. So uh, I did that by adding in um, three matrix fours that basically do nothing and they're called reserve, right? And so uh, this was actually done already on the global ones, but for some reason the instance ones did not have this, right? And so uh, we're probably going to look at uh, something a little bit better to do with this. Instead of using UBOs for this, we might actually change this up uh, so that we're not using so much memory for this. But for now, um, this is required to get that to work correctly. Okay, and then there was also a bug here um, where the UI shader was using uh, the Vulkan Material Shader Global UBO instead of the Vulkan UI Shader Global UBO. So I just changed that, okay? And that was one set of fixes that I had to do um, that is not gonna be part of this series. And I also, um, I also ran into a crash that was caused by update after bind, which I thought I had fixed everywhere, but there were still some places where I did not. So all that really entailed was moving this VK command bind descriptor sets to after the update descriptor sets anywhere where it was before, and it works perfectly now. So there were two places, one in each shader where that was done. And then I added uh, just a couple quick debugging things in here. So uh, I added uh, in here in Vulkan backend.c, I went ahead and added, uh, at least in a comment here, uh, this uh, validation layer, uh, which is called VK Layer Lunar G API Dump. So basically what this does is it just dumps every single Vulkan call made to the console as it happens, um, which as you can imagine, slows things down terribly, but provides us a lot of information on not only what was passed to all those calls, but also what was returned um, in terms of success or failure or whatnot. Um, for all of those calls. So that it is uh, extremely valuable to um, help us debug. So um, I did add that in here as a comment so that we can just simply uh, uncomment this line to use that later. Uh, I also added a quick message here um, when we are acquiring the next image index, if that fails uh, for us to report it so that we actually see when that happens. One other thing that I did is in the Vulkan device. So as we are evaluating all of the Vulkan physical devices and looking at those properties to see if they are sufficient for our needs, uh, we go ahead and throw an info out to say what device we're actually looking at. And 
we go ahead and we spit out the name of it and then uh, the index of it. And that just gives us a little bit more information in the console is about uh, as far as what devices are being looked at, what's available versus what gets picked. Uh, and then uh, one other thing here is I just put in the debug message for uh, swap chain recreation and why it happened, okay? So uh, this is a little bit more of a deep dive. Again, I, I, I've said that we're not gonna be doing deep dives, but I figured this is actually one of those scenarios where we do actually need to deep dive and look at this. So this is a little bit of an exception to the rule, but there we are. Okay, so that does it for the PRs, right? You can see here that we are up to video 40. And now we can actually talk about one other change that I want to make to this project, which is documentation, because documentation is something we've been sorely missing up to this point. So we are going to start filling out the wiki. So you can find that here under wiki. This is, I think, three pages now, two or three pages now, because we haven't actually had a lot of time to start writing these things up. But uh, at least this is for now, where I'm going to keep the documentation of the engine is right here on the GitHub page. Okay, and uh, it's got a very easy to use wiki, which is why I chose this. Um, we may wind up switching to something like MediaWiki or something later on down the road. Um, maybe I'll, I'll host it on the koheengine.com website, but for now, um, I'm going to host it here. And this uh, is very easy to update. So um, basically we have an introduction, some quick links, overview, and whatnot. Um, we also have a getting started page, which is uh, still needs a lot of work, but it goes into uh, required workstation setup, cloning the repository, how to build the code base, etc. cetera. Um, and so as we actually continue with this uh, project and adding features to it, uh, we'll probably be streamlining a lot of this and this will get updated, but um, for now I wanted to get something at least basic up and running so that you guys actually have something to reference. So if there's anything in this wiki that you guys think I should add, feel free to drop that in the comments below uh, because I do read and answer every comment on the channel, at least for now. So um, I will see that. Uh, you guys can also uh, suggest stuff in the Discord server and I will do it there as well. Anyway. Uh, so we have this wiki here, and um, this is basically going to be our documentation for the engine, which again um, is still very, very early days, but this is where it's all going to be. And what I want to do today is uh, the primary thing I want to do in this video is I actually want to start building out the roadmap, right? And so I'm actually going to go back here to the home page, and then down here we say, C, we have this roadmap, C roadmap for the planned uh, roadmap and direction for the future of the engine. When I click on that, we are gonna be creating a new page. And this is what we're gonna be doing right now. Now, for roadmap, uh, there are a couple things that uh, I want to sort of do here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a sort of list of features and it's going to include features that we already have as well as features that we want okay and uh, what we're going to wind up with is uh, basically a a list of engine general features right uh, and a list of renderer features which is uh, sort of a separate thing that's kind of a big enough feature set that i think it warrants having its own section and then uh, we're also going to talk about some UI because UI is a massive part of an engine, okay? And so all of our features that we're going to uh, list out are gonna be at least for now split this way, okay? So I've already come up with a list of things that I want to see in the engine, right? I've got a list of features and these are in no particular order. Uh, I just wanna sort of brainstorm and get them out. Um, and then I would also like to source you guys and what features you would like to see added to a game engine, right? And understand that, you know, obviously I'm the only one building this engine right now, so it's not gonna be possible for me to add, um, you know, the level of features that say Unreal Engine has or, or Unity has, right? That's just not gonna happen. But um, things that you would like to see added, um, feel free to, you know, stick those in the comments and I will evaluate it. And if it makes sense, and it's something that I can tackle um, that is not on this list, 
then um, we'll go ahead and tackle it, right? So the first thing I want to talk about in here is uh, under Engine General, right? And so uh, we have a cross-platform uh, support already. So uh, in this case, we're just talking desktop, right? So we have um, Windows, Linux are officially supported, and Mac is unofficial, right? So we already have those things now, but it's worth putting um, on the roadmap, right? So uh, this is done. Uh, we also have done a our platform layer, right? That's already done, uh, and that is what encapsulates these things. Uh, one thing that we want that sort of uh, tacks on to this guy here is we want official Mac support. Uh, so obviously I've mentioned this before, I want to support Mac officially, but I can't do that until I actually get my hands on a machine. So hopefully that is going to be happening um, sometime later this year. All right, uh, I also want mobile runtime support. And when I say runtime support, um, I'm being specific about that because it doesn't really make sense to have editor tools on an Android. I mean, yeah, it might be cool to make a game on Android, but it's also kind of not really feasible. So uh, I am talking specific about mobile runtime support, and that is gonna be for Android and iOS, okay? So it'd be nice to have that. Uh, again, I don't know um, when we're going to get that, but, uh, you know. Uh, I should mention that we already have a testing framework, which is awesome. We want to expand on that, so I'll go ahead and add it here. Uh, so the next thing is uh, we need some containers. Right? So we need some various types of containers, some of which we already have, some of which um, we need to add. I am putting the dynamic arrays back on this list. Uh, and I'm marking it as a to-do because I want to revisit how they're done because I'm not 100% happy with the implementation of dynamic arrays. So I actually want to revisit this at some point, okay? And um, I also want to make free lists, right? We've mentioned that a couple of times in the last several videos. So I want to create our free lists, plus use them in our buffers. Uh, that way we don't have to manage all that stuff sort of linearly like we're doing right now, which is rubbish, frankly. Um, one thing that we already kind of do have um, that I'll put here is hash table, right? We already have hash table, so that's neat. Um, but we also need uh, a few other data structures. We're gonna need simple things like a stack, a queue, uh, a ring, a pool, a binary search tree, right? Um, these are all things that we're gonna need to build our future features off of, right? I'm putting the logger back on the list. Why? Because I want to extend the logger. So our logger right now is very, very basic. It's spits out to the console and writes to a file, which is, when you think of a logger, that's all it really ever should do, but there's a couple problems with it, right? Uh, so our logger is single threaded on the main thread, which means every time we log something, it's got to wait until that log writes to the console and writes to the file before it actually returns out, right? That's bad, that slows things down, right? Um, and if we ever have a situation where we're logging something during our game loop, um, which is generally, you should try to avoid that, but for debugging purposes, um, if we ever run into a situation like that, uh, it's going to definitely slow things way down. So we wanna add um, multi-threading support to that. Um, and then we also want to add something that I'm gonna call channels. And channels are gonna be a sort of separate way of grouping logs. So right now we have our uh, fatal, our error, our warning, um, info, debug, and trace, right? And those are sort of the log level. When I say channel, I mean we want to have sets of those six types of logging that we can turn on and turn off as we're running the engine, right? So we may, we may want a renderer channel of logging, right? Where all of our logging that we do through uh, the renderer goes through this render channel. Uh, we may want to have a core 
where maybe the application level things uh, go through a core channel, right? And we can turn those on and off. So as we're debugging different versions or different sections of the code, we can turn those things on and off as need be. And it would also give us the ability to be able to say, well, you know, maybe write these ones out to the console, but don't spit them out to the file type thing. So uh, channels would be a very nice way to be able to accomplish that. So uh, logger channels is something that I definitely want to visit. The clock. The clock right now is very basic. So I'd like to enhance the clock and add um, some features to that to make it a little bit more robust and easy to use. Also, our event system is still pretty basic, right? Um, and so right now, uh, it's basically just a pub sub, but we also need to be the ability to uh, potentially broadcast or um, maybe even event polling, which is a little bit different than what we have, right? So um, I want to enhance our event system to support a few different types of events. Um, and I also want to make that so it is potentially multi-threaded. So that way uh, we don't have events being handled that are sort of time consuming on the main thread, right? So we definitely need to uh, look into that a little bit further. So uh, we also need to revisit our desktop input. Um, I want to solidify that a little bit more. Um, so there's still a little bit work of work that I wanna do there. Not too much, but um, a little bit. But adding to input, I also want to add mobile input, which means touch screen. Um, pinch and zoom and things like that. Uh, I want to add that kind of uh, functionality as well. And that, of course, hinges off of uh, this right here, mobile runtime support, right? So um, those two things sort of go hand in hand. I also want to add gamepad support, right? Uh, because gamepad support, obviously, is pretty dang important. Another thing that... Um, I want to sort of revisit is our string library because our string library is kind of basic right now. And I would like to introduce a sort of K string structure that works a little bit like uh, you might expect, say standard strings or something like that to work. That gives us a little bit more um, almost object oriented uh, handling of strings, um, but we still want to keep it light, right? So that way uh, we don't have to for example, manage the memory of those strings. Uh, we could have a, a, a string handler that sort of does it for us and we don't have to think about that. Um, and so I would like to enhance our string library and add um, a K string structure, right? All right, so um, one thing that we already have, uh, of course, is our math library. So that's a big one, right? Um, so uh, thankfully, uh, that is done, but I would like to eventually support SIMD on that, okay? Now, uh, another thing that we currently have is we have a linear allocator, which is great. Um, the problem with that is you can only allocate, but you can't free, right? You can only free the entire thing because it's not, there's nothing, um, keeping track of where and when the allocations are made, right? And so for that, we need what I'm gonna call a dynamic allocator, which works kind of like malloc does, but it works from a pre-allocated pool of memory so that we're not having to reach out to the OS to actually get that memory. Um, so basically the dynamic allocator would work, um, would pre-allocate a chunk of memory and then be able to um, allocate and free sections or blocks of memory of varying sizes within that block of memory, right? And obviously it would need a free list to keep track of all of that. So um, this is for variable size allocations, right? Obviously uh, this is not going to be as fast as a linear allocator, um, but you know, you sacrifice a little bit of speed when using this um, versus a, a linear allocator, but you also get functionality, right? So there's always those trade-offs. Uh, one other thing that I want to do is a pool allocator, which is basically a um, used for object pooling. So that's an allocator that basically has uh, fixed size allocations. For example, if you wanted to hold a 
whole bunch of vector threes, right? Or a whole bunch of, let's, let's say transforms, right? Which has position, rotation, and scale. If you wanted to hold a whole bunch of those in a allocator, you could use a pool allocator for that and, and allocate or free um, individual allocations based on that. And they're, because they're all of the same size, it's very quick. Um, so there are gonna be sections of code where we're gonna to want to use pooling uh, and that goes with our pool structure here, uh, where that is going to be um, make a lot more sense versus you know allocating and freeing memory all the time. Okay. All right. So the next one is something that's kind of been brought up a couple of times, and this is a systems manager uh, plus a system interface, which all systems should match. So one thing that we have. Um, in our current code base. And actually, I'm going to pull this up. So if I go to application.c, we have a couple issues with this, right? So one thing is our application state has all of these various memory requirements and then void pointer blocks for the state of all of our systems, right? And this is kind of well, it isn't kind of, it's very repetitive, right? And this is not ideal. And the other half of this is, is we have these initialize uh, calls here that are made for each one of our, our systems. And they're not 100% sort of the same or consistent as one another. And then later on, we have all of these shutdowns, right? And this is not ideal, right? Ideally, what we should have is each one of these systems should have a sort of interface that it matches where the initialized call looks the same. It's passed a memory requirement, a block of memory or not, and then a configuration for that, right? And most of the most of the uh, recent systems that I've added work exactly that way. So they'll translate to that pretty well. Um, but uh, some of the initial systems did not necessarily do that, right? So uh, our event system initialized, for example, um, only takes the memory requirement and a block, but it doesn't take a config. Um, and so what we need to do is go through these systems and make them all fit the same interface where they take uh, mem a pointer to memory requirement, a block of memory, and then a configuration. And then uh, we will go ahead and set up an interface that we can use for that, which is basically going to be a structure with a bunch of fun function pointers for initialize and shutdown. And then we can feed those structures through and set up the function pointers to point to initialize and shutdown for each one. And then we can just pass in that structure to a, a new system manager that can then just keep an array of those structures and it doesn't have to worry about having all of these things included everywhere, right? So it'll just make it a little bit cleaner and a little bit more consistent. So that's one thing that I definitely want to do, okay? So let me get rid of this. And one other thing that obviously we need to do is threads, right? And a couple of things I've talked about so, for, so far, um, talk about threads, right? Our logger, uh, enhancements actually talk about threads. So actually, uh, like I said, these are in no particular order, but threads is going to be something that we're going to have to address sometime pretty soon, I think. Um, so we want the ability to multi-thread our engine, right? We, for example, if we're loading a large model, we don't want to hang the entire engine while that model is being read from disk. Um, we want to keep things running, right? And just handle that, that loading into memory on another thread. And then once that's ready, pop it over to uh, the renderer to be uploaded to the GPU. And the renderer itself will eventually be multi-threaded, but we'll come back to that. So um, with threads, we don't necessarily wanna be using those, uh, you know, sort of directly all the time. So we're gonna want some sort of job system to be able to do that. And a job system will be able to be kicked off from anywhere. And uh, that will basically handle picking and using a thread to handle the job. And then it will have a callback to say when the job is complete to notify whatever is actually listening for that. And so um, the job system is going to provide us a way to sort of decouple um, a lot of logic from 
the actual process of loading and be able to make it so that we can load more things, um, more than one thing at once, right? So uh, we also, we have our resource system, but uh, you know, right now we've only sort of, oops. So right now we have uh, only a few different loaders for that, right? We have the ability to load binary and text resources, image and material, but uh, we are gonna need to add uh, some additional loaders. So we have some to-do loaders, which are our bitmap fonts, which is something that we're going to be setting up very, very soon. Uh, something called system fonts. I'll get into that when we actually start talking about fonts. And then um, also a loader for the scene. And there's going to be a lot of other loaders, but these are just some examples of some of the loaders that we're going to need. We also want to eventually look into a binary format for our textures with a conversion tool to convert from JPEG, PNG, Targa, whatever, to a single format that the engine uses and cares about. And the reason that we want that is it'll be very fast to load that content in. We don't have to worry about um, running some sort of crazy compression or switching on file formats or um, any of the performance issues that come from all of the data conversion, right? We can store the image data in a format that we require that the engine automatically understands and then we could just bulk load that in and not have to worry about translating it, right? And so uh, this is something that the end runtime would wind up using. Obviously an editor needs to be able to use those uh, flexible formats, but um, the binary format is obviously something that we're gonna eventually want to uh, ship a game with, right? So uh, we need the ability to use a binary file format along with the other formats um, in the engine, okay? So with that, we wanna talk about resource hot reloading, right? And uh, this is exactly what you think it is. If you have a texture on disk and you make a change to that texture and save it, uh, the engine should pick up on that save and reload that texture into the engine and you should see it in real time. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and at some point talk about resource hot loading um, or hot reloading, I should say, uh, so that we can go ahead and use that. All right, uh, next, we want an entity component system of some kind, right? Um, and I'm still kind of going back and forth on how I want to structure this one because there's a lot of ways to skin this cat, right? Um, but an ECS is pretty important to the structure of a lot of game engines. But I want to actually structure our engine in such a way where it does not require the use of an ECS. If you want to use an ECS, feel free but we should have the ability to not require it, right? So I wanna be able to do things in a sort of um, procedural way and have the ability to code out scenes, but also have the ability to load a scene full of uh, components and entities and be able to, to work that way. So I'm, I'm looking for the ability to work in either way, right? Because not everybody loves an entity component system. It doesn't solve every problem that there is out there. And so we shouldn't code our engine to require the use of one of those things, right? It's one way of working, but it shouldn't be the only way of working. So uh, just note that that goes with uh, any discussion of the ECS. So uh, with that, we also need to talk about scenes or levels, right? Um, and the ability to load and unload those things, right? So um, with that, uh, as sort of a sub point, we have um, the need for a file format and the ability to load and save, and of course, unload um, those scenes and levels, right? We also need uh, some other things like ray casting, right? Ray casting is kind of another one. Um, so uh, this sort of hinges off this scene um, and the editor and the ECS and all that because we need the ability to, from the editor, uh, reach out and click on an object, which is also known as object picking, right? So this kind of goes in hand, hand in hand with all of this where um, you should be able to have the editor open and not just pick it from a list, say over on the side of the screen, but also be able to click directly into the viewport and be able to select an object that way. So uh, Object picking actually requires ray casting. So we're gonna need that. While we're on the subject of an editor, 
we're going to need some gizmos, right? And this may fall under the UI territory, but can also kind of be rendered in the world. So it's kind of both, but not. Um, and so I'm putting it here for right now, right? And gizmos are basically the little um, objects that you can interact with that allow you to move an object or rotate an object or, you know, scale it. Um, things like that, right? You'll, you'll have seen them in, in 3D Studio Max, for example, or any other um, game engine editor out there, right? So gizmos are kind of an important piece. So that's uh, obviously something that we want. Um, we need a world editor. And of course that goes uh, along with that, the ability to uh, save and um, inload scenes, right? So obviously we need a world editor to be able to uh, edit the world or a scene at a time or multiple scenes at a time, right? So we're gonna need that. And uh, now we have a couple of big ticket items, right? So audio, audio is a big one. Um, and this is gonna be one of those parts that we're probably gonna wind up using a library for initially, um, just to get things up and running. And then at some point we may wind up rolling our own implementation. Um, and so the way that I'm going to set this up is I'm gonna use an adapter pattern for this, right? Where we're gonna basically hide the actual audio implementation behind an interface. Um, and that interface can just work with the rest of the engine. The engine doesn't care about the underlying audio implementation. And that way uh, we can start off using a library. And then when we go to write our own, we can just pull out the library and jam in our own implementation of it and we'll be good to go. So audio is a big one, uh, which is why it's in all caps, because that's a huge part of game development. And another huge part is physics. And physics is probably gonna be another one of those sections where it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for me to roll this from scratch. Um, and I may wind up writing a basic, a very basic physics engine for maybe 2D physics or something like that. But, um, there are physics libraries out there that uh, do a way better job way quicker than I could do in a video series such as this one. So uh, what I'm going to do is use a pre-existing library for the physics and again use that adapter pattern to hide the implementation of that behind um, an adapter. That way if we do want to switch it out or change what kind of phys physics we're using, we can do that. But I probably will wind up um, using like physics or something um, for the physics, right? Because physics engines take a very long time to write and I don't see the value there. So um, there's that. The next one is a bit of a question mark um, and this is networking. I may or may not add networking support because networking is another one of those things that is very complicated and the networking needs of every game are pretty much different, right? Um, like a First person shooter has very different network requirements to an MMO, which has very different network requirements to say something like a casino game or um, like a match three game or, or social games, things like that, right? They all have very different needs. And so um, networking is something that I probably will add way, way down the road. And that's a big maybe, um, but at least for uh, the first version of the engine it's probably not going to include this but i want to add it with a question mark anyways uh, in case we do wind up actually getting to it uh, we also need um, and this actually kind of goes up here with uh, scene and level we actually need the ability to have what we're going to call prefabs i don't know that i'm going to stick with that term i think that's more of a unity term than anything but it's basically uh, the ability to take an object or several objects and combine them in a pre-configured way and then save that configuration and reuse that as a single object um, throughout your scene, right? And it's it's uh, it's basically, you can think of it as a mini scene within a scene, right? And so um, prefabs are, are kind of a, a nice way to be able to repetitively build complex objects. And so we're definitely gonna need that uh, at some point. Also, we are going to need Profiling, right? Um, profiling is going to be a big thing once we start talking performance. Um, and this is going to be everything from frame profilers to stack profilers. And we're gonna talk about the differences between those things. And um, we're also gonna use uh, 
some internal ones that we develop ourselves as well as some external ones that are readily available so that we can evaluate those, see what the difference is. And, um, you know, they all sort of have their different uses and pros and cons. And so we'll be evaluating all of those things and reviewing that. And, um, that will be in the profiling section. So another big thing that we want is a proper editor and runtime binaries. And these are basically going to almost replace, but not quite replace testbed. So our testbed right now is our sort of bootstrap application for us to be able to actually run our engine, right? And we're gonna use that to test new engine features because we're not always necessarily gonna to wanna to go through an editor or a full game to test a new feature, right? That doesn't really make sense. That's what the testbed is for. But uh, we want the ability to have an editor that we can use to actually build out our levels and our UIs and our things like that. Um, and so that should be an application all on its own that includes things like the ability to hot reload assets and things like that. And then uh, we're gonna have our runtime binary, which is basically going to be what the game that you're creating uses, right? And uh, that runtime binary will be very, very lightweight. It'll basically just contain some basic hooks to start up the engine and then load a DLL for the game, or I, should, I say a DLL, that's on Windows, but um, load a library of code for the game that is hot reloadable, right? And so uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. Actually, you know what? I'm just gonna add that right now. Um, so with that, uh, game and editor logic, DLL hot reload. And I know a few of you have asked me about this, um, given the current state of the way things are architected, how are you gonna be able to reload the engine? Because I know initially I was saying I wanted the ability to hot reload the engine. I'm not convinced at this point that that's actually going to be the correct way to do it. Um, and so I'm actually gonna pivot on that. And instead of loading, hot loading the engine itself because it's so core to the way that everything works, uh, I think the engine is going to be responsible for hot reloading a game or editor uh, DLL or library. Let me say library. DLL. SO, etc. right? So we want the ability to hot reload those things, but not necessarily the engine itself, okay? All right, a uh, couple of other things that have sprung to bind. So uh, we are going to have need of key maps and key bindings. This sort of sits on top of our input system where we can then uh, bind a specific key input to say when you push this key down this command gets fired and then that command is connected to some function that gets called that actually executes um, some sort of code and so uh, this is not going to be something that the testbed would use for example but it's something that you'd want to use in a game so for example um, you would have one key map for let's say you're, you're developing a first person shooter game, right? So you have one key map for actually playing the game when you're in the world and you're moving around. And then when you go into a, a menu, you would have a separate key map that gets applied that uh, instead of you know your WASD moving around in the world, maybe it moves your menu options up, down, left, and right, right? Um, and these key maps or key bindings would also be done for game pads as well eventually. Uh, but uh, we need the ability to basically change those mappings on the fly and key maps are the way to accomplish that. So that is what we're going to do there. All right. And uh, the next thing that we want to go ahead and talk about is something that I'm going to call KVARs. And these are configurable global settings, right? We don't have a way to store any sort of global setting in the engine right now. And a global setting might be something like, what's the resolution of the window, right? We would have to have specific knowledge of, um, of the platform layer to actually access that information, right? Which is far from ideal. We should have some sort of variable that um, when we get it, will tell us the resolution of the window. And if we set it, it should change the resolution of the window, right? So um, we are gonna have a KVAR system that uh, is configurable global settings for things like that, um, as well as uh, user configurable settings. 
um, that can be used to um, not only handle um, various states of the engine, editor, game, you name it. Um, there are tons of things that, that could be used for. Uh, and so with that, um, there is going to be engine configuration and that's gonna be um, things like what default renderer is used when we start up the engine. Uh, that should be configurable. Right now it's always gonna use Vulkan, but um, as an example, we are gonna be implementing OpenGL and DirectX and maybe even Metal. Um, and so uh, engine configuration is actually going to cover uh, that type of thing, right? Uh, engine specific, not application specific or game specific or editor specific, but engine specific settings, right? And there are gonna be those things. So engine configuration is a good part of that. Uh, all right, um, so a couple of other things. And again, I've said these are no in no particular order. I might go and clean this list up later. But uh, one other thing we need is a timeline system. So we need some system where we can say, okay, uh, we want a sequence of events to occur. Uh, so we'll say, start the sequence now, a second later, um, pull up a dialog box, um, half a second later, start typing this text onto it. And then a second after that, um, we should be finished typing out the text, make a button show up on the screen, right? So it's a very linear secret sequence of events. And a timeline system would be the way to do that. There's tons of things you could use a timeline system for. That's just, um, you know, a small example of that. One of the things a timeline system could be used for, it, it could be hooked into a skeletal animation system. And so this is uh, something that all games are, are gonna require, right? If you have a character in your game, chances are it's gonna have a skeleton and be animated using that skeleton. So um, we are going to set up a skeletal animation system and parts of that will use our timeline system for tweening and things like that, okay? The next thing uh, we need is we need a terrain engine. And uh, this is because we want the ability to sort of go in and be able to edit terrain within the world, right? That should be part of the world editor. And uh, we should be able to add, remove uh, boxes and be able to sculpt the terrain and paint textures on the terrain, materials, things of that nature. Um, and we should be able to do all that in real time. And then uh, we should be able to bake that uh, to be used in uh, the final runtime version of the game, right? So we need a system that handles all of that, um, as well as obviously collision and ties into the physics system for you know making sure that you can walk around on the terrain. Uh, so we need a terrain system, right? Um, and we're also going to need uh, another kind of small thing, sky boxes, sky sphere. Might help to have those instead of hall of mirrors or rubbish, clear in color. So um, those are just a couple things that we need to add as well. Now, um, this is all I'm going to add right now for general features of the engine, right? So what I actually want to do now is move on to the renderer because we have a number of features that uh, we've either already done or need to do for the renderer. So um, one thing that we've already done is this, the renderer front end, back end architecture scaffolding, right? So that's already done, which is great. Um, we also are working on our Vulkan backend support. So we're going to continue uh, building that out as we go. But uh, we also, have mentioned this before that we eventually want to add uh, DirectX, OpenGL, Metal backend support, right? Uh, metal with a question mark because I don't know if I want to support that one yet, but maybe eventually. Uh, we already have support for textures, which is good. We already have support for geometry, which is also good. We have some support for materials, but we need to expand the system quite a lot uh, because uh, our materials right now are super basic and don't even have any lighting or anything like that, right? Um, and so actually that's another thing that we're going to um, need is lighting, but we'll, we'll actually come back uh, to that in a second, right? So uh, the next thing that we're gonna need, and this is uh, something we've kind of already done, is renderable texture support. And this basically is uh, a texture that can be rendered to um, via any sort of process, whether we're generating noise for a texture or a water texture or something like that. 
um, and then can be reused in the world or for something else, right? And we're actually using renderable textures right now. Um, our swap chain images are renderable textures, right? These are also known as render targets, right? So our swap chain images are an example of render targets, right? They are the image that something gets drawn to, right? And we want to uh, create renderable textures in a reusable way where the engine doesn't have to be concerned about things like frame buffers and whatnot, um, where really all we care about is just saying, hey, we want to um, draw a cube map to this texture or something like that, right? Um, and so uh, renderable texture support is gonna be something that we're going to go ahead and add in. And then uh, we are also going to uh, sort of reconfigure our render passes to actually use those renderable textures among other things, right? Uh, okay, so we also want uh, automated geometry generation. And this might be something that's sort of a general feature more so than a renderer, but I'll put it under renderer for now. Um, this is the ability to generate 2D and 3D geometry. So like a cube, a cylinder, or a square, um, or a circle, um, things of that nature, right? So we should be able to input some parameters and uh, be able to easily generate that geometry for um, test purposes or otherwise, right? Uh, so one thing that we already do have, I've mentioned this before, is we have multiple render pass support. We already have that, but it's not configurable. So I'm leaving it here on this list. Right, because we want to actually be able to configure that um, and not have that be solely a mechanic of the Vulkan backend. We actually want to uh, extract that out and make that a sort of global uh, thing that is is uh, available on the render front end. Right, so we can configure those things on the front end and let the back end figure out um, how that needs to work. So, uh, with that, actually, we have configurable render passes um, and tech. Technically, this uh, also includes frame buffers and to use renderable textures, right? So uh, we have a lot of the underlying tech on this, but we need to expose these things to the front end in a way that makes sense and is configurable. One thing we need to add um, sooner rather than later is the Fong lighting model. And when we actually get into this, um, I'll describe what the Fong lighting model is, how it works, uh, but it's your basic uh, it's your basic lighting model that's been used in games for the past 20 years, right? Um, and uh, so it's it's a it's a basic enough lighting model to sort of get our feet wet in understanding how lighting works, um, but it's not quite what you get from Unreal and things like that with your PBR, right? And so our fog lighting model is going to be one lighting model that we support, uh, but it's not going to be the only one, all right? Uh, and so to do that, we need specular maps and we need normal maps, which when we add the support for these things, I will describe in, uh, in great detail as to what they are, how they're used and how they're created. Um, but um, you can think of this as sort of a shininess of the surface. And then um, a normal map is sort of the bumpiness of a surface. And that's where I'm gonna leave that for now. So uh, we then need the ability to create advanced materials. We need to be able to animate things on the material. We need the ability to be able to um, generate materials on the fly, uh, things like that. So um, we're gonna need all sorts of parameters to be able to add to our materials. And again, we'll be touching on those things as we add them. So the next big item is PBR, which is physically based rendering. Um, and this is a lot more of a realistic lighting model than your typical Fong lighting model. So eventually this PBR is what is going to be the primary lighting model for the engine. Uh, but that's a little bit of a ways off, right? Um, we want to get sort of this, um, this bit of it working first. And then PBR is just sort of built on top of that, right? Uh, and then I mentioned this earlier on, but we want multi-threading support for the renderer, right? And uh, this is specifically going to be for Vulkan and Direct 3D 12, right? We're not gonna do multi-threaded support for either older versions of Direct 3D or uh, OpenGL. Those are gonna be single-threaded renderers, but uh, for Vulkan and D3D 12, uh, we are going to be uh, multi-threading those renderers. And that is it right now 
for the renderer, right? So uh, obviously, oh, you know what? There is actually one more thing. Batch rendering, uh, and this is gonna be 2D and 3D, right? So we want the ability to um, perform batch rendering uh, because that's going to be a lot quicker for rendering UI controls, for example. We don't want to render those one at a time because all those draw calls get very expensive. We want the ability to say, here's a bunch of these, render them all in one shot. Okay, so batch rendering is going to be uh, something that is super important for us to touch on, um, and that's probably going to be coming sooner rather than later. Okay, but uh, that is it for the renderer. Now, uh, the UI, I have separated this because of the number of controls, right? So um, I'm going to basically list off some of the basic features of a UI, and then we're going to really quickly touch on um, all of the controls that I have in mind that we should be adding, right? So obviously we need a UI system. We don't have that yet. So we need a system to handle UIs for us, changing um, screens, uh, hiding windows, uh, showing windows, things like that. Uh, we need a concept of layering because all UIs have layers, right? Um, and then we also obviously need a format, um, a file format to store the saved uh, UI configurations in, which means that we need to load and save them as well. And then, uh, let's see. We are also going to need a UI editor where we can actually do um, layout work of the UI visually versus having to sort of script it in a file because that sucks. Uh, we're gonna need to handle things like control focus or tab order to be able to hit the tab key and go through all of our various controls in the correct order. So we need to be able to define that. We need to be able to uh, dock controls to various parts of the window, right? Oops. Uh, we also need, and this is kind of a big one and probably one of the harder ones to implement, drag and drop support, right? Um, drag and drop can get uh, really, really difficult really, really quickly. Um, so we need that support, right? So finally, I'm going to paste in our UI controls, right? And so this is gonna be sort of the last thing uh, that we need. So we've got uh, UI controls, um, and this is one of the few engine level areas that uses object-oriented programming, right? Um, and I've talked about this, not at length, but at least a little bit. I don't think object-oriented programming makes sense everywhere, but there are places where it does make sense. Um, and so we'll probably wind up jumping into a discussion about that at this point. Um, and why it makes sense here, but it doesn't necessarily make sense in other places. We have used a little bit of OOP uh, throughout the engine, but um, at least at the core level, I don't think that it's needed. Um, and frankly, it tends to get in the way. Uh, but I think uh, at this point, uh, once we get here, it's definitely going to be um, worth discussing, right? So the way that this is gonna set up, uh, be set up is we're gonna have a base control, which all controls come from. And a base control is basically going to provide a couple things. It's going to provide um, a show and hide method as to whether or not it should be uh, rendered. And then it will provide a position. And that is about it, right? Um, it doesn't actually render anything on its own. It's not meant to be used directly. It's meant to be inherited from. And so the base level control will be what we're going to call a panel. And any of you who have done UI work uh, specifically with uh, Windows will know what I mean when I say panel. It's basically just a, a box that you get um, that has potentially a background color but could be transparent or could have um, an image background, which technically if we wanted an image background, we could use this box, uh, image box here. Uh, and it's basically given a specific size and of course it inherits its position from the base control. And a panel is generally something that you would place other controls into to sort of logically group them and visually group them. Um, and so an image box is basically just a panel with the ability to add an image to it. A viewport control is another type of panel where uh, it is basically used as a render texture and you render a scene to that. So um, right now we're sort of rendering our scene to um, directly to the surface of the window. 
And that's just a temporary measure. That is not gonna be the way that we're gonna work um, in perpetuity. Once we have this set up, which requires several other pieces, renderable textures being set up, um, the configuration of that, and then uh, our UI system and our viewport control, once those things are set up, uh, we're actually going to switch over to render our world in a viewport control, right? So in order to see the world, you're gonna need a viewport control that is tied to that world. And uh, that is the way that that is gonna work. And that gives us the ability to have more than one of them uh, for one thing, but also we can resize it on the screen, put other controls around it and so forth. So uh, a viewport control is probably gonna be the, one of the first controls that we actually get in there and start making. Um, we might do this text control first, uh, only because that is a nice and simple way to display text on the screen. So we are gonna support uh, system and bitmap fonts. So system uh, bitmap fonts are basically predetermined sets of characters that are rendered to a bitmap and then you bullet those on the screen. Uh, whereas a system font is basically read from like a TTF file or something like that. And you render out those characters, um, you rasterize them to an image and then you uh, bullet that image, right? So it's a little bit more involved. Um, but we are going to be supporting both, right? So the text control will support both of those. We'll also have a rich text control. Um, so for the system text, it'll have the ability to um, assign multiple colors to the text, bold, italic, etc. So lots of different kinds of formatting available. Versus bitmap text, since the characters are mapped directly to what we're going to call a glyph, uh, you don't really have the ability to bold or italicize them, but you do have the ability to change the color. So uh, a rich text control using a bitmap font will support uh, multicolor only. We'll have a button that is clickable. That'll be an object that uh, looks like a box, basically, with text in the center, optionally, um, or potentially an image in the center that you can then click on. Um, it'll also be a selectable control. Uh, we'll have a checkbox, pretty self-explanatory. Radio buttons are the little round buttons that you get um, where you can have, say, a group of three of them and you can only choose one at a time. So uh, those are radio buttons. Tabs, um, we'll have a control where you can um, select various tabs. And then uh, as those tabs are selected, uh, content below it would show in hide. Uh, we'll have windows slash modals complete with resize, min max, restore, open close, etc. So those are the your basic windows like you'd expect here. Uh, we'll have uh, resizable, what I'm calling multi panels, which will basically be a like a split panel. Um, it'll have the ability to have um, one set of controls here. Oh, it'll have the ability to have one set of controls here, one set of controls here with a vertical split that you can then mouse over and move that back and forth. Um, that's just an example. It'll work horizontally as well. So we'll have uh, resizable, resizable multi-panels. Obviously, we'll have a scroll bar, um, a scroll container. So that's a, control, a container that will overflow once you uh, exceed the vertical or horizontal width or height um, that is available um, to that control. If, you, if your content exceeds that, then it'll place a, the appropriate scroll bar and you'll be able to scroll that. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have a text box control and a text area, which will be selectable as well. Um, and that'll be focusable, I should say. Okay. So, this pretty much uh, is what our roadmap looks like. But there are some other items that I want to cover as well. Um, so, those other items are, uh, we want documentation, which is something we've already touched on. Uh, and then we also want auto generated uh, code documentation, right? Uh, and this is going to be generated off of the source files that are available um, in the repository, right? So um, in order to get that, In order to get that, uh, this is going to require that the entire code base, whoops. This is basically gonna require that the entire code base be gone over and commented. 
Um, and we're only going to worry about, you know, sort of publicly facing um, functions and variables and things like that. Uh, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to write comments all over the code base to determine um, or to describe uh, the exact functionality of those functions, what they do, what parameter, um, what parameters are valid, what they should return, etc. And then we're going to run a program that's going to go over all of our code files, extract those comments out, and generate HTML pages that we can then use as a guide for those things. Um, and that will be helpful for end users that um, wish to actually look at um, that documentation to figure out how to use um, internal engine specific uh, aspects of code without actually having to go and you know look at the code itself. Obviously you could go and look at the code itself and that's a way of understanding it, but having it there um, you know sort of on the website I've found is is useful in a lot of cases and it's a pretty common thing to do um, in game engines. So all right, so uh, this is pretty much what our roadmap looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this. In fact, I'm just gonna copy all this just in case the save fails. Go ahead and save it. All right, so this is what our roadmap looks like for now. So there's a lot to do. Some of this is already done, but not much. So this is um, this is where we're going. This is This is where the engine is gonna take us, so. Let me go ahead and switch back here. So that's it. Uh, that is where we're going to go. That is where the direction of this channel and uh, specifically this video series is headed. And uh, now you guys have a roadmap of features that we're going to be building, right? Again, I said that these things are no uh, in no particular order, and that's true. Um, but I am going to start planning now as to what some of the next features are that we're gonna develop. All right, so anyway, uh, I promised that there are not gonna be any long videos uh, after this one. I'm going to try and keep all the videos uh, well under an hour uh, going forward. So I realize that this video is a little bit long. I realize that we deep dived into some code, um, but this is sort of the transition point into the new way of doing things. So um, anyway, I don't want to let this go on any longer. So thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate you guys uh, following along and giving me feedback along the way. Um, if you guys have features that you would like to see in the engine, please put them in the comments below or comment on the Discord server. I see most of what happens on there. So, um, and then I see everything that happens on the YouTube channel. So uh, if there's anything you guys would like to see or anything that I've missed, cause I'm sure I have missed stuff, um, please go ahead and comment that. All right. Um, again, thank you guys so much for watching. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. Click the little bell notification icon there to get notified as to when new videos in this or other series drops. And I will see you guys next time.